Last week, uh, my wife, Kara, and I celebrated 16 years of marriage, and uh, yeah, we're cheering for her. This is a miracle that she loves me and still likes me at this point. Uh, That's a great thing. I remember when we were first dating, uh, very early on when we were dating, we lived in uh, Virginia Beach, and uh, she was a master's student getting her master's degree in counseling, and I was a youth pastor in Virginia Beach, and we loved going on dates to uh, take a long walk on the beach. I know it sounds cliche, but we loved it. And uh, so one day after work uh, and after her classes, I drove over to her house, picked her up, and we were headed and driving down to the beach for our date night when I saw it. And when I saw it, it changed everything. I wasn't thinking about our date anymore. I wasn't thinking about the conversation that we were gonna have. I wasn't thinking about the ice cream that we were gonna have after the date. No, when I saw it, it changed everything. It changed my thoughts. It changed my direction. It changed my uh, even passions in that moment. And you may be wondering, what is it? It's very simple. It's the hot now sign at Krispy Kreme. There's something about the hot now sign at Krispy Kreme that absolutely grabs my attention. Like we could be driving to the emergency room and I could see the hot now sign and say, you know what, I think you're gonna be fine. I think everything's gonna work out just fine. We gotta stop for a donut. It has a way of grabbing and capturing our attention like no other. And like that, God has a way of of grabbing our attention, of capturing our attention. It could happen through simple life circumstances. It's happened in my own life where I can see how God has used something, put something in my life that totally grabs my attention. But the good news is you and I don't have to wait until it happens in our life for God to grab our attention by circumstances. We can just simply look at someone else's life and learn from their mistakes instead of having to learn from our own. We see this very clearly in the story of Jonah that has an entire book of the Old Testament dedicated to how God grabs the attention of Jonah. Sometimes it's through neon signs in our life. Sometimes it's through God's grace and kindness and love for his people through the hot now sign. Sometimes there are billboards that capture our attention. At other times, it's just when life happens. But I want us this morning to take a look at how it happens in the story of Jonah. So if you've got your Bible, I wanna invite you to turn over to Jonah. We're gonna pick up where we left off last week in verse 17 when scripture says, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Notice the very careful Uh, an intentional selection of words in describing where Jonah's at today. It says, the Lord appointed a great fish. This is no happenstance. This is no uh, just accident that it just so happened by coincidence that a hungry whale was just floating by. It's not like we catch up with this whale at the very end of his or her end of the Whole30 diet that they're on, and now they're kind of switching from krill over to profit, and so they're gonna try how this whole thing tastes. No, this was God's fish that God sent in this moment that was part of God's great plan where he directed and guided, orchestrated in his great sovereign plan, a whale to radically capture Jonah's attention and save his life. Because this massive storm that uh, caused a whole lot of anxiety in everybody around obviously wasn't enough. A storm that God hurled out onto the sea didn't capture Jonah's attention in that moment. Jonah, man, how did we get here? You are literally in the belly of a whale. Well, how we got here was God said to Jonah, up to this point, God has said to Jonah, go, and Jonah says, no, no. And after that, everything was always and only down for Jonah after that. Jonah, scripture says, went down to the city of Joppa. 
where he could catch a ship to the very furthest point of the known world at that time. On his way down to Joppa, Jonah stops at an ATM. He withdraws his entire life savings so that he can purchase this ticket to Tarshish. I'm sure there's a moment where he's calling his assistant, hey, clear my schedule for the rest of the year because this was a long journey. Make sure you forward all of my mail to the city of Tarshish. I'm gonna be over there because God said go over there and I'm going the opposite way. And so Jonah went down to Joppa, bought his ticket and went down into the ship. Jonah was fully committed to doing exactly what God said He was fully committed to not doing exactly what God said to do because of his pure hatred for the people in this area of the Assyrian Empire called Nineveh. This is, if you're laying this over a modern day map, the the city of Nineveh is literally in the city of current day, modern day Mosul, Iraq. It's kind of a headquarters of sort for ISIS and ISIL and terrorism there, it's said, and many scholars have written that the Ninevites invented terrorism. They created this whole brutality mindset because they were a completely murderous group of people who were the biggest, baddest, cruelest people on planet Earth. Anyone who rebelled against the Ninevites would face the fury of the Ninevites. Anyone who rebelled against their empire, they would torture them and skin them alive, literally bury them up to their neck in the desert, in the heat of the desert. They would break their jaw open so that they would completely suffer in the most brutal way possible. And so for Jonah, what began as a step in the wrong direction ended up in mass destruction because this ship that was headed for the end of the known world ended up escalating into a mass chaos for Jonah and these shipmates because God hurled a great wind in chapter one on the sea. Not like a little rainstorm. No, this was like the storm of the century. The wind is whipping, the waves are crashing, the hull was flooding, the ship was literally about to break in two And all of these rough and tough sailors who've spent their entire life on the open waters are completely terrified. Where do we find Jonah? He's down again. This time he's down at the bottom of the ship, laid down fast asleep. It's almost as if Jonah has uh, decided to drink an entire bottle of NyQuil. You know NyQuil, right? The nighttime sniffing, sneezing, aching, why did I wake up naked in the front yard kind of medicine. He's had the entire bottle and it's knocked him out because he's laid down fast asleep, hit the rim cycle of sleep just because he's so relaxed. And so all of a sudden these polytheistic pagan worshiping sailors take up some old time religion. And they start to ask Jonah, why aren't you praying? We're all up here suffering. We're all up here losing everything and you're down here asleep. And so they decide to cast lots. They decide to roll the dice. And when they roll the dice, it rolls snake eyes. Okay, this is Jonah's fault. It's this guy's fault. But what we've got to see in this story, in this story of Jonah, is so much like our own story. There's a little bit of Jonah in all of us. And what I don't want us to miss as we rewalk through some of this is that your running from God never just affects you. Your running from God affects everybody around you, especially those closest to you, your your coworkers, your neighbors, your friends, your family, your parents, your kids, your spouse. What begins as a seemingly innocent step in the wrong direction can lead to mass destruction. Every time I make a dumb decision, it affects my wife. It affects our kids. Whenever you run from God, whenever you make a bad decision, your kids, your family is gonna suffer the fallout. Whenever things get sideways in our personal life, we get on this mode of self-destruction. Your kids, your spouse will get hit from the shrapnel. You think about pornography. Pornography is often this like one-to-one thing where someone engages online in this 
separate lifestyle thinking, you know what, it's just, it's, it's innocent, it's just me, I'm not harming anyone else. But you gotta realize and recognize that the intimacy issues that come from this addiction go so much further than just you. You think about an emotional affair. Oh, it's just innocent. We're just having a conversation. This was someone I grew up with in high school. This was someone that I knew back in the day. It's just an innocent conversation. You don't think that that has impacts on intimacy? Think about those mind-numbing things that we get wrapped up in, whether that's the scrolling or whether that's just the, the reading or I'm just gonna put something on the TV to get my mind off of what I'm really wrestling through. You don't, you don't think that has an impact on our soul? Those moments of workaholism, when we say we're doing this to provide for our family, but in reality, it becomes cheating on your family with a job. Those moments of chasing leisure and comfort or finding our worth in social and financial status. Don't just think that you're running and your sin or your addiction or your issues just affect you. No, it hits a lot of people. And so family, we, we ought to, we need to desperately work on healing and working on our own recovery so that we can stop accidentally hurting the people that we're working on loving because we're projecting our own wounds onto them. Let's stop all the collateral damage with that. And the best part is, you don't have to step on your own landmines. You don't have to figure all of this out on your own. You can just look to the story of Jonah and see all of the mistakes that he made and we can learn and grow from that. If Jonah doesn't hit for you, then look at Abraham. If Jonah and Abraham don't hit, look at Joseph, look at David, look at Elijah, look at Peter, who is a disciple of Jesus himself, and we can learn from the failures of others instead of learning from the failures in our own life. For Jonah, his failures caused this storm, and the only way for them to stop the storm in the moment is to toss Jonah overboard which is where we pick up in the story all the way down to the icy, cold depths of the ocean. In arguably one of the most famous stories of all time, Jonah and the whale. But this isn't just a story of Jonah and a fish. Uh, in fact, the story isn't about a fish at all. If we focus on the great fish, we could lose sight of the great God who captures the heart of the story of Jonah because this is in fact a story about a God who will stop at nothing to get our attention, a God who will stop at nothing to change our life. So Jonah is swallowed by a fish. On the outside, it looks like it's the end for Jonah. He's tossed overboard. This has gotta be the end of his life, but actually, we see that he's being carried by God. Sometimes it can look like our our life can just swallow us whole. It looks like, it even feels like in our life and in our circumstances that it's the end. But the mystery of faith is that God uses all of these things, the good things, the difficult things, the, the moments of celebration and the times of grief, God uses all of this to carry us toward his purpose for us. Which communicates to you and to me that even when we're running away from God, God is passionately pursuing and chasing after us. When we want nothing to do with God, God still does everything for us. We see it in the story of the Red Sea. The Red Sea couldn't stop Moses and all the Israelites. The walls of Jericho couldn't stop Joshua. The giant of Goliath could not stop David. Death couldn't stop Jesus and Jonah running didn't stop God from running after and chasing after him. And so in the dark depth of cold, in the belly of this fish, it probably reeks of fish stomach, of digestive juices, of dead fish and salty water. Jonah, who's away from everyone and everything, uses and leverages this moment to pray, to cry out to God. And this is what Jonah says 
from the belly of a whale, and thanks to modern technology of Pixar and Finding Nemo, we actually know what it's like to be in the belly of a whale. And so, in Jonah chapter two, verse one, it says this, then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and all your billows passed over me. Up to this point, Jonah has stiff-armed God. He's just run away from God, and now Jonah takes this opportunity to pray, and this is just a reality I don't want you to miss this morning. Wherever you're at, however far you've run, however dark and how deep your circumstances are, the truth and the reality is God is still with us no matter where we go. Often when life feels darkest, God is nearest. In fact, God did more on your behalf last night as you slept than you or I will do on our behalf as we're awake. Who held back the waters of the Red Sea so that his family could walk across dry land? Who calmed the storm with just one word? Who slayed Goliath with just one stone? Who tore down the walls of Jericho? Who brought life to dead, dry bones? This is our God. Which means that in those deep, dark moments, God is still with you. This is the moment that Jonah is in, not just literally, but spiritually. Jonah isn't just literally in the body of a whale. He's emotionally and spiritually, relationally separated from everyone and everything in the deepest, darkest moment of his life. Uh, And he says that I called out to the Lord out of my distress. This word distress is the Hebrew word zara. It's the same word that's used of a woman in labor. uh, The distress of labor. And so in the depth of his despair, in the most painful moment of his life, Jonah cries out to God. And God heard him there. And so when life is crashing down, when life is completely debilitating, uh, when it's devastation everywhere you look and overwhelming and you're completely overcome with fear and anxiety and depression, when you are at rock bottom, you can still cry out to God. I don't care where you're at. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what's happened in your life. This text shows us that God hears our prayer and that we can still approach God wherever we're at. And so at rock bottom, cry out to God. But please don't hear me saying, wait until you're at rock bottom to cry out to God. Uh, Up to then, you just keep doing you, boo. No, I'm not saying that at all. No, the guys praying in the story were the guys who were pagan. And now it's Jonah. Oftentimes we see in so many people's life that when they reach the bottom, when the wheels come off, when all of our plans fall apart, your finances run out, you, you might finally at that point turn to God. I'm just telling you don't wait until that point. Corey Ten Boom says this, you may never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. This is where Jonah's at, crying out from the belly of a whale. And we pick up the story again in verse four. Then Jonah said, I'm driven away from your sight. Yet shall I again, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. The weeds were wrapped around my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Jonah says he's in this moment looking to God's holy temple. Now, as a local church pastor, uh, I could leverage this to say, hey, everybody, this is Jonah's moment saying, come back to church, come back to church. I looked at God's holy temple, but that's not what the text is talking about in this moment. So I don't want us to, to teach or understand something that's not in the text because that, then that becomes my opinion and not the all-powerful word of God. When Jonah refers to looking at God's holy temple, 
what he's talking about is a prophet of God. Jonah would have known that God himself promised that his very presence would be in the temple and that at the mercy seat of, uh, of the Ark of the Covenant, God promised in Exodus that he would speak. So his presence is there, his voice is heard. And so as Jonah says, I look to the holy temple, what he's saying is, God, I'm looking to your presence. I'm looking to hear a word from you. And yet Jonah has just been going further and further down. He's made terrible decisions, which is the story and is the case whenever we run from God. We don't make good decisions when we run from God. We heard it last week, sin makes you silly. And Jonah couldn't get any lower, couldn't get any deeper, any further away from people, any darker or any more stinky, and maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you look at your own life and it feels like your life is spinning out of control, like you're helpless, hopeless, struggling, desperate for something, anything. And in these moments, I wanna challenge you, I wanna encourage you, don't waste your waiting. You can rest assured that God, wherever you're at, hears the cries of your heart and that he's big enough to oversee the whole world and he's caring enough and loving enough to care about you at the same time. God would rather have you cry out to him with your doubts than walk away from him with your pain. Yeah, we, we may enjoy God in the mountaintops of our life, but we get to know him intimately in the valleys of our life. And Jonah, no doubt, was in a valley. Verse six, at the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you, brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord, my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake the hope, their hope of steadfast love. But I, Jonah, with the voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Jonah cries out to God. God answers him from the belly of a whale and God brought up Jonah's life from the pit. Translation, God finds us wherever we go. God pursues us wherever we're at. Notice the first time the word up in Jonah's life occurs in the text is when the Lord moves. This is the first time up is used to describe Jonah's circumstances since everything has always and only up to this point only been down. Yet God shows up and Jonah's life begins to turn up. Translation, you may have run from God, but you can't run so far away from God that he is absent. You may have run from God, but God will never run away from you. You may have abandoned God, but God will never abandon you. Your life may feel out of control, but it is never outside of God's control. You may feel alone, but God is with you yesterday, today, and forever. You're not gonna find rescue. You're not gonna find hope. You're not gonna find the joy that you're looking for anywhere else outside of God himself. It's why Jonah warns us in verse eight, and says, those who pay regard to vain idols, forsake, walk away, abandon, completely leave behind their hope of steadfast love. This is a, a Hebrew word called hesed. This is a word that we heard in the book of Ruth, but it's a word that in the Hebrew means the steadfast love and mercy and kindness, it's everything good about God wrapped up into one word. And this one word, hesed, shows up over 250 times in the Old Testament alone. This word, hesed, shows up in a person named Jesus in the New Testament. And what are those things that we run to and cling to as we forget about the hesed, steadfast love of Jesus? Tim Keller says usually an idol is a good thing that we make an ultimate thing in our life. 
An idol can be a good thing that takes the place of the best thing in our life. And Jonah is leaning into us saying, hey, 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 I know when you hit rock bottom, it's gonna seem like there's something else that's missing in your life. Hey, hey, listen to me, everybody, listen. When you are desperate, when you're overwhelmed and you're overcome and you are in a tough spot, you're gonna be tempted to look to idols. You're gonna be tempted to make good things the best thing, but I'm telling you there's one thing that will change your life and it's the steadfast love of God. And so as he says that, this is good news for us today. It's good news for Jonah that he remembers the steadfast love. It's good news for us because the steadfast love of God is available to us. And Jonah makes this grand statement as he closes out right before he, but right before God hits the eject button on this whale's indigestion, Jonah makes this grand statement in verse nine when he says this, salvation belongs to the Lord. What does this mean for us? It means that salvation comes from God alone. What does this mean for us? It means that your sin is never too great, your, your predicament never too difficult for God. Jonah didn't have to bargain with God in this moment. He didn't have to work to convince God or try to impress God or try to negotiate a mutually uh, agreeable settlement that each party would be content with. No, he didn't start quoting scripture. He didn't start making spiritual promises. Jonah didn't start beefing up his religious resume. No, the story doesn't go Jonah was left for dead, but then he went to church and everything was fine. Uh, No, the story doesn't go that life was miserable, but Jonah just started reading the Bible and boom, it was fixed. No, it was Jonah wrecked his life and failed, but God changed his life. No, the story is that Jonah was left for dead, yet God rescued him. I've created a mess, but God worked a miracle. And it's not just Jonah. Elijah, another prophet of God, was considering suicide. Yes, depression is real, and so is God. Job said he wished he was never born. David was depressed. Moses was anxious. Hannah was barren. Paul was alone in prison, but God set them free and used their mess as a message, which means that God can turn our darkest moments around for good, and that we can choose to worship him even in the storm. And when we worship in the storm, we begin to gain eyes to see God at work in our story. We get courage to trust God with whatever we're carrying that may or may not go away. You may walk the rest of your days, the rest of your life, carrying this burden of depression, this overwhelming Weight of anxiety. You may walk through your entire life carrying this overwhelming burden of infertility. But yet, the ugly part of your story is gonna become the most powerful part of your testimony. The most painful part of your story might become the most life-giving part of someone else's. God can bring meaning from our mourning and purpose from our pain. Listen, God is bigger than your past. God is bigger than your pain. God is bigger than your anger. God is bigger than your fears. He's bigger than your scars and your insecurities and your sins. God is bigger than your doubt. And I don't know how God's gonna intervene in your life. I don't know when God intervenes in your life. For some of you, you've been waiting for a really long time. I can't tell you God's schedule for your life and your family. I don't know God's calendar or God's timetable, but scripture over and over again shows us in crystal clear ways that God intervenes in history. God intervenes in your life story, and it might not be when you want it, but he will intervene. I just wanna encourage somebody this morning to keep going. Maybe you've given it everything that you've got and right now you're just feeling tired. You're feeling overwhelmed. You're feeling like maybe you've wasted your time. You wonder if you've wasted your energy and your resources. Maybe you're 
just feeling misunderstood, on the verge of giving up. You've wondered if it's worth it. You've wondered if they're worth it. You've wondered if God's heard your prayers. Wondered if God even cares. You've wondered so many things that your heart is now wandering. And you can't seem to find your way back. If that's you, don't panic. God's got you. He's not forgotten you. He's not forsaking you. And he's not gonna stop making a way for you. It has nothing to do with the circumstances and everything to do with our savior. Everything to do with this character trait of God that's the Hebrew word hesed. It's the loving kindness, the steadfast love, the never ending mercy and faithfulness of God. Brennan Manning says, God loves you unconditionally as you are, not as you should be, because none of us are as we should be. The list of things that can separate us from the hesed, steadfast, loving kindness of God is an entirely blank page of paper. There's nothing. Paul says it like this in Romans chapter eight, as he's just finished and come on the heels of this grandiose theological treatise of what God has accomplished, Paul says this, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all of these things, Paul says, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. Translation, none of this stuff that we can see, none of the things that we fear, none of the things that we're worried about, none of the things that we experience will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Can I tell somebody today that scripture's not written on a dry erase board? This promise is not written in a way that can be erased in your circumstances. No, this is a story of God's love, steadfast mercy and kindness for us. What we see in this story of Jonah is not a story that God's angry with Jonah. We don't see in this story that God sends a storm because he's upset with his prophet. It's not a story about how God's angry with the Ninevites so he wants to condemn the Ninevites. No, this is a story of God pursuing Jonah. This is a story of God chasing after the people of Nineveh with the unfailing love and mercy, just like he pursues us. And nothing will stop God from getting our attention. His love is relentless. God can use self-inflicted or even others' inflicted circumstances to wake us up and draw him to himself. Maybe today you've received the gift of grace. Maybe you have experienced this love and kindness of God personally. But you know that's not the end of your story. Salvation is not the end of your story. No, growing in Christ, maturity is moving us from being a recipient of God's grace to being responsible for, to being responsible for extending God's grace. Those people that you're offended with, those people that you're uncomfortable with, uninterested in being around, whether that's a political difference or just a personal preference, those people are the same people that God is deeply in love with. Sure, there are moments that we repent enough to be forgiven, but do we surrender enough to be changed by Jesus? Or, or, or is it, hey God, I, I want salvation. I wanna get out of hell, I wanna get to heaven but just don't ask me to love somebody that I'm uncomfortable with. Which is exactly what God said to Jonah. There are moments where we're convinced and we think like, okay, we're really following Jesus. We're giving this all that we've got. And then he throws someone in our life that makes us uncomfortable and says, love them. Someone in our life that we disagree with, 
that we vote different, that we look different, that we talk different, that we smell different, that we act different. That he invites us to serve someone who hurt you, to bless someone who's betrayed you, to minister to the people who drug your name through the mud. Friends, this story of Jonah is not a story about a man and a fish. It's not a story about consequences and condemnation. It's a story about how God pursues us and never gives up. So today, are you, are you running from God? Is the Spirit of God prompting you and pushing you to repent of the moments with the people that you've been just like Jonah? Run from them as far as you can go. Is he inviting you to surrender, to slow down? Are there areas of your life that God just wants to redeem? So this morning, will you lay it all down? Will you say yes to his great love for you and his great love for others? Let's pray. Lord, I confess that there are moments where I don't wanna do what you've called me to do, what you've created me to do. And so God, would you do what only you can do in redeeming that so that I can show up in the ways that you've invited me to show up? God, would you bring conviction through your word? Uh, Would you bring correction to our lives through the truth of your scriptures? And Jesus, would you so radically change our lives that you radically change this community, this city because of your radical love for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.